times. I won't go, I'll let him introduce himself at the same time. Oh, uh, yeah, bodyguards. <laughs> so, I'm going to follow up on Norman's awesome uh, vermicomposting. My first note says explore vermicomposting, which is um, having some type of a system where you're feeding uh, worms some type of a product, anything, leaves, food waste, and you're capturing the castings or the worm poop. And uh, I've been interested in making compost tea out of it, vermicompost tea. And I have a couple different brewers. I have a 350 gallon brewer and I have a 60 gallon brewer. We have a brewer now at HPA at the upper campus. And we have a couple more around. I have one at my farm in Michigan. And I've been playing with the idea and working with Ted Radovich, um, who's been over a few times. And we have a microscope. And so we're, we're interested in what's going on in, in this amazing product, this vermicompost. In. I use it on my farm. I also brew it and take it and apply it to different um, Right now, my focus is getting people on the ocean off of the drugs. So off the pesticides, off of all, you'd be amazed at how little of the fertilizers get digested over in those type of a dry environment. You can go there and see all the little pellets and all the pieces sitting there. And the landscape crews that are going there are, you know, they're, they're just making a living, basically. The kids are making a living, they're getting nine, ten bucks an hour, they're going like this, they got their iPhones on, they're Facebook, and they don't, they don't realize that it's building up. Then it rains. How much rain have we had over there this year? It's insane. It's really crazy. I was working at uh, Monica, Monolani a while ago, and we got three rain outs in a week, where we had to actually, like, close the job boxes and put tools away. Because it was pouring, literally big drops. And I've worked over there for five years. It's, so then that stuff washes right out. And it's washing right out into the ocean. And uh, we have a, a long-term vision. I'm working with uh, Micah at Bioscape to create like a nonprofit overarching uh, entity that will foster education for the uh, landowners over there and for the landscapers and the workers, everybody. So everyone can kind of have this overarching educational institution that then will also have a business that also provides uh, products and training for them. So they could come, let's say, to our store and get compost tea. And they could just drive it in the morning and we're brewing it and we just download. And we can tailor our compost to have the different set of organisms to treat different issues that are going on. Something um, that Dr. Elaine Ingham has taught me is, uh, you know, fungally dominant or bacterially dominant soils. So we've been playing with that at my farm, making compost that's more fungally dominant, making compost that's more bacterially dominant. Grasses like a, a higher uh, bacteria, as do your row crops, lettuces, carrots, things like that. But an orchard, the trees have a, a symbiote relationship more to fungi. So that's, um, you can also mix some vermicompost in with your uh, seeds when you're doing your potting soil. So you can, you know, all of your waste on your small farm or your house can get bokashi, it can go into that system, it can go into your worm system. You can, you, it can all be recycled in. And it's coming out, the worms are just doing magic. So the stuff that's coming out is just a, it's a magic trick. And um, so that's part of what I'm interested in. Um, I also want to tell you about another project that's kind of exciting that um, I've been working on with uh, a group of folks from uh, kind of around the mainland uh, that are trying to purchase the old Haina sugarcane mill site. Haina is below Honuka'a. Is everyone somewhat familiar with Honuka'a here? More or less. It's, so it's right below there. There's a mile straight down below there. There's an old sugarcane mill site. It was the last operating mill on this island. For even 20 years, the mills were closing further down the Hamakua coast, and so the cane was going there and getting processed. And uh, we believe, and several people, even Elaine, has kind of agreed that that might be the largest compost pile in human history. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just going to show you. Would you give me a hand? Would you give me a little assist here? I don't see any clips. With the flourish. For the flourish. So let's just put this up here for a minute. This is a side profile, go a little higher, a side profile of where the, the gas 
and the topsoil and the rock that was stolen from the Hamakua coast during this harvesting of the cane was deposited. There were three conveyor belts that went out of the back of the plant, and they were walking conveyor belts. They moved back and forth, and um, there were bulldozers operating. Uh, this is the big A-frame that's there. It was the Beck Gas House. This was just built in 1981, this big building here. And this is the resource base here. This is 1.6 to 1.8 million cubic yards of topsoil, bagasse, and rock, and they're layered. The rock isn't as perfectly layered as the soil is because they use more dump trucks to take the bigger stuff that was two foot plus out there and dump it, but it still got pushed around. And there were two bulldozers working around the clock, especially in the last 20 years when they were getting everything from further south all the way up. This is uh, about uh, over 120 feet deep. This is a 26 acre site where just the gas pile is. And this is the basalt bedrock down here. We've mapped it into all different areas. There are just cattle running on there right now. They're pretty happy. And uh, it's a 50 acre site. It's an industrial site. It's got 440 uh, power. It's got big water. And it's been um, abandoned since 1994. There's, uh, this is our idea of what we'd like to do there. We would, it's centrally located between Hilo, Kohala, and Kona. It already is an industrial site. It has a separate access road because the power plant is right here. Hamako Energy Partners, they have a 747 engine there holding to the ground. They're making power there, so there's a road coming down, Shell Oil Road. It has its own access. It's not going by anyone's house. Uh, we've got noise studies already done. We have the bagasse. We, we've done lots of tests. Uh, Professor Matthews has grown corn in different amounts of the bagasse and then ashed it to check on the arsenic and other toxins that's below background soil level. Um, a lot of it is not available. It's not bioavailable. The really bad stuff was pre-1929 and we have to go way down here and we don't think we'll ever get there because if we can get green waste brought in and food waste brought in, and we can ferment it in Bokashi closed containers with the trucks having their access down the road and backing up and it gets shredded and the drier stuff gets mixed and it could go in here and it could go into this. This is about the third largest closed building in the state. This A-frame is would cost over six million dollars to build that today. And it's there sitting, it's a birdhouse, really. It has underground uh, systems, it has a huge gantry crane in the roof. There's all concrete, it's already poured all around, it's got roads all around, it's got a house, it's got, it's an amazing resource base. When I first got turned on to it, it blew my mind. So we had our whole kind of process of where it would go, we had a bunch of people studying it with us. So anyway, thank you very much for your flourishing. But I just wanted to point out that there is an amazing resource base there. If we even go uh, to the small numbers, there's a million five hundred thousand cubic yards of asset there. At about nine feet deep, it's 151 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, slowly because it doesn't have the oxygen because it's somewhat compacted, right? Right now, but we just did last year, a year ago, a year six months ago, I guess now, we um, hired a geologist and a geographer from the National Geographic Society. He's also, but they're both also professors and friends of ours. And we brought them in and I bought a, or rented an excavator. We dug 12 test pits. And we kind of GPSed them out. We, you know, the the uh, geologist came in and said, you know, do them here, do them here, do them here. Let's get a good sample. So we went down 12 feet deep and I built screening boxes and we screened it every two feet. We had a whole crew of people. We shook it and we sorted everything out and we mapped everything and we found some really interesting, it was making biochar in situ in the ground yeah. and uh, uh, Roger Coons has worked in 60 different countries as a geologist and he had never seen it going on anywhere and I mean 151 degrees is hot and if you guys really put your hand against it, you really can't touch that. A hot tub is really really hot, it's 106 degrees <laughs> that's almost uncomfortable for me to get into. That's don't have enough fat. Um, so it's just cooking off. It's going and going and going and there's just 
so much potential there. I see it as a, a greenway site. Um, my, one of my ideas that I like to share is that I, I live in uh, Pawilo, and we don't have in Pawilo or Honoka'a uh, a separate green waste place to dump your waste. So I see guys going in there all the time, landscaper guys, trucks just full, palm leaves, just you know what I'm saying, it's insane. And I, I would even say that Norman's numbers were, were low. Um, we, we suspect that 75% of the stuff going into the landfill is compostable. And probably there's just so much food waste going in there. The pigs could be eating it. We could pickle it. We could do all kinds of stuff. We went over and talked with uh, Nick Nicolaitis over on uh, Oahu and checked out his recycling operation and tried to get an idea of what the what the um, where's the food waste going and who's who's moving in this direction and what can we do about it. So we've been working on it for about three years. We're um, I just need like about a four million dollar loan, I think, <laughs> to purchase the site. We need to actually buy the site. Um, we've done some work with. Uh, I just met with the planning or uh, with uh, two of the, the planning guys from uh, Kamakua and um, another another one of the guys from Kalu because we had some kind of a social thing. So I said, hey, can I come down and show you this? And they were like. How could anybody in county government not be fired up about this? Everyone's got to be on board. And I, I do have a little PowerPoint thing here, but I only wanted to show it just to give you an idea where the map was and show you almost it's halfway between Kona and Hilo. So if we're ever going to shut down a, one of the landfills, it never needs to landfill again. It just needs to be cycled. And we've got the A-frame that's 310 feet long, 115 feet wide, and the ridge beam is 90 feet straight up. And it has underground conveyor systems with trap doors and a gantry crane, and it's con the concrete walls on that, they're, they're 20 inches wide, and you know the knee walls themselves are like 12 feet tall, and they probably go on the ground 10 feet. Um, there are also a 500,000 gallon concrete circular tank and a 250,000 gallon circular tank next to it so that the liquid that comes off of the food fermentation process would be guttered right to a sediment tank to take off the thick stuff, which could then be processed again. Then the liquid goes into the, we have the biggest vortex brewers, compost tea brewers in the world, which get pumped into tanks that go right down to the Hamakua uh, co-op, and we could spray right on the farmer's fields for them. We could fertigate for them. It could be just a closed loop. There's rock in there. There's about 400 to 500,000 yards of rock. And you call it prepared rock because we don't have to mine it. We don't have to break it out of the blue rock, right? So that could be the roads for the farmers. You know, so it's a great asset. One of the most well-respected organic farmers on the island and currently farms in the Waimea area. Uh, well, thank, thank you very much for that. Uh, well, I just so many people, you know, shared with me that over the years. Oh, okay. well, um, yeah, I'm, uh, we farm 20 acres of certified organic veggies up in the Alameda farm lot. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, I originally became interested in soil health back in the 70s with uh, Rodale's Organic Garden. Uh, and we were experimenting with composting, uh, chipping up uh, Christmas berries. And voila, it steamed up uh, all on its own overnight. So I just was uh, fascinated by it. I attended UH Manoff uh, in the late 70s, uh, in 382. Um, Unfortunately, we didn't dare bring up organics, and it's nice to see that you, uh, the college has changed its tune over the years. Um, it was a hippie thing back in those days. <laughs> uh, not to be taken seriously. Uh, but anyway, uh, soil health is, uh, the knowledge of soil health has really evolved over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, I was lucky enough to be a horticulturist out at Mac Farms La Hoy back in the late 80s through early 90s. And the Aussies were very interested in organic. Uh, approaches. We went so far as to clean up all the uh, 
manure from the feedlot on Oahu. We bought a whole barge load in. We were getting bagasse from uh, Hamakua uh, and mixing that with the Mackinac husk. We made about 40,000 tons of compost in the five years that I was there. Um, then, and they actually had the 300 acres certified organic, but they were a decade ahead of their time. They couldn't find a market for the nuts, so they, during the uh, economic crash back in the early 90s, they dropped that whole project and shut my department down, which is when I became a edge farmer, <laughs> out, of, out of necessity. Um, we, I used to make uh, compost from uh, the chicken farm on Kauai High Road, uh, mixing that with, uh, again, um, crisp berry chips and mackinac husk. I took the soil on my, my farm in Kainalua. Uh, it started off at 6% organic matter. I took up 20 in the course of, and that's documented from U.S. Soil Labs. Um, <coughs> Over the course of 10 years, uh, we sold that farm. I got a lease on this place in uh, Lalamilo. It's starting off at 3%, and I'm having a really difficult time budging that uh, organic farm uh, level. Um, with FISMA and NOP, composting, at least with manures and stuff, is going to be extremely challenging. Uh, so, what we are approaching, what the approach we're taking now is using cover crops. Uh, different mixes. Waimea is real different than the rest of the state. A lot of, there's been a lot of work done at lower elevations with different cover crops. Uh, but we're semi-temperate up there. So I, we're, I encouraged uh, Ted Radovich to do a trial. He's got a winter cover crop trial that they, they completed a few months back and they're going to be planning the summer cover crop trial. So we're interested in seeing the results off that. Um, I'm also chairman for Mauna Kea Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, we're trying to bring in cover crop seed at bulk for um, our group. Uh, anybody who's got a conservation plan within, within our district. Um, and we're trying to get uh, Ray Archuleta, he's uh, the cover crop guru at NRCS out of North Carolina, uh, to do a, some work, uh, at least a workshop with, uh, for the YMA guys in June. So it's, it's a constant challenge. Um, but I am seeing results that on the farm I was at, it was farmed chemically for 40 years. Uh, soil texture was pretty bad. You couldn't find an earthworm on the 20 years. They, they weren't there. Now there's a, I got a lot of earthworms. So it's a constantly uphill battle. Unfortunately, when you're in production, you don't, it's hard to visualize um, a lot of the techniques and methodology that you guys are promoting. Uh, you know, we got a crop. Uh, 52 weeks of the year, so it's, you're, it's, you've got to stay focused on actual cropping and, and instead of, uh, you know, expanding into different areas. Uh, so it's, it's interesting. Um, and uh, the potential that you, is being explored uh, is really good to hear. It's, you know, when you're on the farm, you don't see what's going on in the, <laughs> on the rest of the island too much. But uh, it's really, this workshop is really good. I didn't get the call until yesterday afternoon. <laughs> uh, somehow my name got missed on the email list. But uh, I want to thank Margaret for uh, inviting me because it's, it's very enlightening. There's a lot of things going on on the island that's uh, very, very positive. Noah Dodd, and he does a lot of things, but he, uh, one of those is to teach composting on a community level, and how to keep it really local, and how to get all of us as individuals doing our kuleana and making all of this happen. And I think that whole issue of being, keeping the, uh, what we take from the soil, that it goes back in place, and I think he epitomizes a lot of that in what he does. <clears throat> thanks. Um, I also wanted to say thanks to Margaret. She really persuaded me to come today, um, and I think she's really made a diverse platform here, so I applaud her efforts in that and say thank you to that. Um, a brief background <clears throat> myself, I, um, I didn't go through the education system very well. I, um, <laughs> I always start that off that way. And um, I ended up in charter schools, and then... Um, Graduated, had a high school diploma by 17, got a car, got a job at a restaurant, and went to culinary arts school. Got my culinary degree, 
and then traveled the United States targeting certain um, high-end restaurants. A huge passion for food and then um, came over to Hawaii, had difficulty finding the same passion, realized that it was held up in a few restaurants, uh, not broad. So I actually, by the time I found a restaurant, I had lost a passion. And um, not that it doesn't exist. And, and that's one thing that I would like to say about uh, the future of the agroecology. I do believe that it is a diverse, culminating, one of our biggest culminating projects, perhaps, in our lifetimes. So uh, I'm here speaking openly in that I hope that our systems can all work together and the change will be together. Um, so some of my current work keeps me busy for the last three years as a HPA school garden coordinator and developer. We just finished our last third year on Wednesday. We've taken a, about a quarter acre and developed it into a nice uh, natural organic farming paradigm. 10,000 pounds of uh, food has come and gone into this kids and healthy snacks uh, or cafeteria things. And so I have some industry knowledge that I'd like to share about uh, what's happening with our food system and getting healthy foods to kids. Um, as well, I also um, <clears throat> strive to become a farmer. <laughs> I want to become a farmer. I live on 40 acres and we're slowly increasing our, um, our farm one, one thing at a time and it's a, it's a learning process. We recently just had a goat um, due to lack of mineralization get paralyzed and then through probiotics and minerals the goat lives and walks. So. Uh, it's about the depletion of what we do have in our local soil systems and ecosystems as well. And some of my industry knowledge working with uh, technology that's helped. I would also like to look at uh, Clarence Baber uh, from Island Herbs. I've worked with Clarence and studied with him. Uh, as an EM tech, he's brilliant. And I also believe that EM uh, was created to help solve the problems of the world and would like to give credit to somebody for introducing me to that product. So. I would like to start with actually that product and go back to beneficial microorganisms and uh, Dr. Higa was an inventor of EM1. Dr. Higa, like Master Fujioka, was a chemical farmer <laughs> and he practiced chemical farming for many years until he realized that he was killing the soil. Um, basically, inside of chemical farming, we could look at chemical farming similar to antibiotics in the body. Uh, when we really take a strong antibiotic, it wipes out most of the beneficial ecosystems and leaves us with a challenge of rebuilding those ecosystems. It's saving lives, but it's also very controversial. So, uh, Dr. Higa realized he'd been doing this and he decided to spend the rest of his career fixing that problem. So, what he did is he came up with EM1, which is a beneficial blend of microbials. And really, the way that I could explain this, because it's, for me, I learned through doing and I'm a, a I'm very simple, my taste, my touch, my sight, uh, and, and I like to play with science, I'll catch up with the science, but um, basically what happens when we take chemical farms and we look at them, over time we make disease-inducive <coughs> soils, so they're actually inducive of more pathogens and bacteria that are harmful for our environment. So currently one of the biggest challenges is to get people to stop chemically farming, okay, fine. So then the next thing that happens is what's our biggest thing in organic farming that's going to help remediate? Well, it's organic material, compost. So when you take <coughs> organic material and you put it in a disease-inducive soil, guess what it does? It breeds more disease. So even changing our chemical farmers over to using more compost, which needs to be put in three-month intervals or routine applications, you realize this is one of the biggest challenges. And in, in here, especially in the Asia-Pacific and our equatorial longitude belt with the constant humidity and no close of uh, the breeding season for these guys. It is one of the hardest challenges for myself is uh, not the nutrient, optimum nutrient for the plants, but keeping um, things like fusarium and uh, other uh, plagues I have down, uh, what did I put down, fusarium, mosaic, uh, charred beets and spinach, get that little dot on them, that's a fungus too. And so a lot of conventional uh, combat to this is, well, you got to cut it out, bury it, don't ever grow anything there for two years and come back to that area and try again. Hopefully you've sterilized it. And for small farms, that's not going to work. I mean, you can't, you can't quarantine an area of your farm for two years and say this is unviable for a certain vegetable to grow. So it's in the probiotics, it's in the beneficial blends of actually healing our plants on a regular basis. So uh, frequent when you switch over, when you start using organic material, you'll realize that it's, it's in a frequency of low dosage, 
but constant frequency. So every three to five days you're applying something that's helping the, the, the body, the beneficial um, probiotics for that whole ecosystem. So um, <laughs> the first step is to get a disease resistant soil. So once you've got that going, what you're going to be doing, and this is a, in the Korean natural farming as well, is it's a lactic acid secretion. That's actually acting as an antiseptic. It's not the probiotic, but it's the antiseptic that's sterilizing and cleaning and remediating that, allowing it to not be inducive of disease, but suppressive. Once you have that, then it's in the fermenting and curing of organic matter into beneficial plant-soluble forms, which takes yeast and funguses and the right ones. So all of these things are in EM1. Um, basically, um, I'm not going to go too much further into the whole thing with composite soil and uh, the whole different blending. There's a whole chart inside of these books. I have lots of literature you can uh, link right here. So the disease inducing and how it goes around from the zymogenic to the synthetic to the composite. Well, I was a composite soil junkie. Like I really like to build soil and I wasn't looking at what it was until I look back at it. And so it's really in this balancing of utilizing our uh, soils here, mixing them with these composite blends. But overall, hands down, as a person who's watching vegetables on a yearly basis, I can't, um, if I'm gonna do organic fertilizing, it's the compost, putting enough compost back into my beds that disappears, organic matter. And so, and not only that, but it's, it's the variety of which goes into your compost. And a lot of what we have is landscape trimmings and and these things, and they're very atypical and don't have the, the diversity. The more diverse the compost, the more long-lasting effects into the uh, soil. So uh, I'm gonna kind of segue into uh, waste management and some sort of things that I think for, um, currently I do work um, also with Recycle Hawaii. And so everything I say, I work with these people. I'm here as a concerned citizen. Um, but So I work with Recycle Hawaii, we teach backyard composting workshops at the farmer's market in Waimea. And um, the first thing we do is we teach basic composting, which is your aerobic with air style of composting, and that's about an hour. And then the second one we do is we teach a bokashi compost, which is a fermenting, it's a pickling of your food garbage basically, and then and putting it back out. So the whole reason why we're doing this with the county is that we're trying to calculate how much waste people can divert in their own backyards. So the earth machine, for instance, has a capacity of 80 gallons. It takes one year. So we give out 3,000, you do the math. They're, so that's how they're kind of running the funding for that program. Um, but what's kind of been coming really clear to me is, is that it's the it's the blend, it's the culmination of all of these, and that's why we really teach the Bokashi composting um, at the end, because in your conventional composting, meat and dairy, and a lot of other products, cooked foods are shunned. And so, um, it's not really feasible. I always ask the question, how many of you are vegetarians in this room? And it's, well, we could. We could do it by a show of hands, but you'd find that uh, maybe 10% in a very vigorous class of vegetarians. 90% of us, have this, and then also the same thing with our municipal waste, the downstream municipal waste that the green waste people don't want to deal with is food contaminated green waste. And so when we take that and we pickle it, what it does is it sets it off on a jump start into this decomposition chain where basically worms, I mean you can, you can take meat, dairy and cooked food, pickle it and then put it right into your worm box. It's completely fascinating. So where they teach you, oh you have to be selective about what you feed your worms, I think they should be a little bit more broad in selecting some of their knowledge because we can feed everything to the worms if we do some of the proper processes before it reaches to those um, products. So again, um, and then I'll get into some certification because I know this class is already running really long. For myself, I want to get the food into the cafeteria. So we work with Sodexo. Sodexo is one of the largest uh, people that cook the food for the kids. And for Sodexo to receive any food for any institution they work for, it needs to come from GAP certification. So GAP certification is an abbreviation for Good Agricultural Practices. It's an, a way of uh, putting people up to liability and assessment for what they're doing on their farms. And it's built off of OMRI, which is Organic Material Review Institute, and Sustainable Washington, some of the two highest certifications that people are trying to obtain right now in organic farming. Uh, OMRI means that you can just bring everything in onto your farm as long as it's stamped with their logo. Sustainable is actually, uh, there's a couple certificates, uh, excuse me, certifications. 
Washington and Oregon TILF. So Washington's is a little higher, Oregon TILF allows a little more, and what that is, is about 70% of your fertilizer is made on site. And that's a sustainable certification. So you're only bringing in 30% only product. So that's really where I think if we're trying to jumpstart this, we should be looking at that. And um, <clears throat> so an only certified farm is up to this outside audit agency and basically everything on side that farm needs to be OMRI approved. And so for myself, EM1 is OMRI approved. Effective microorganism is OMRI approved. And I can take it down to commercial farming viability. I can bring it down there. And it can do all of these things. And it lives up to department of health, food safety issues, some of the big things that are really going to challenge us. And so when we look at natural farming, it's been around for a long time. Japan natural farming is one of the oldest natural farming places uh, almost longer than Korea, Japan Natural Farming, uh, you can look that up, and Japan Natural Farming has decided to use EM1 with their natural farming because of the liability issues, what they can look up to, and so when we're looking at getting organic matter back into our soil at a large scale, the waste remediation things, working with large schools, universities, and doing this with our day jobs still viable, when we can have a product that jump starts that, and then work back with it, I would really hope that people could see that what I'm encouraging is that it's IM with EM, that it's biodynamic with EM, that it's conventional farming with EM. And these are something that we don't need to sit there and study under a microscope for the next 15 years. Let's get a little bit of a jump start, take some of the community research that's already been done in Japan, uh, Churchill or Church Christ New Zealand, they're a big one. If you're going to take waste and you're going to go ahead and compost it, you're going to cook it to 190 degrees. I'm going to kill everything inside of that. I'm going to sterilize it, but then I'm going to start revigorating it with that EM technology, getting it back up to those standards. And then I think from that point, that's where we need to get our studies more progressive and how we can unlock the Hawaiian fertilizer chain. But only certification, GAP certification, uh, already are being offered here. GAP certification is there's um, two agents from the university that are going around trying to help with that. And I really feel that people say it's out of reach, it's unobtainable, we've got to pay for an outside auditor, this and that. But a lot of the work that, um, that you would do would help you run a small business up to food safety standards for people not to get sick and it would not cost you any more money. It would actually save you a lot of time. So thank you very much. wind up on the speakers from the group that hadn't spoken. And then we'll have a few couple minutes for those who are on the list that have spoken to prior. Um, quickly about some of the history about uh, this trend that's been going on with moving uh, from basically biodynamics, which was started by Rudolf Steiner, Mokichi Okada in Japan, who started Japanese nature farming, uh, looked at uh, uh, Steiner as a, as a mentor, and then uh, Master Cho went to Japan and studied um, uh, the Japanese um, uh, uh, nature um, farming, and, and uh, with EM, and with biodynamics, there's a lot of great review papers out there. Um, and as Jan, I, I really appreciated her pointing out, is that a lot of these practices, it depends on how they're implemented, the environments are implemented, like how the rock dust is prepared. And if you look at the literature from the professional societies in agriculture, uh, like the American Society of Horticulture, the American Society of Agronomy, et cetera, a lot of it's, they, the, the scientists come up as kind of inconclusive because of the approaches that have been taken and the lack of quality controls in the research. So there, there really is a need for quality research where, where university personnel work with uh, uh, the, the practitioners and make sure things are done right. Because if you look at it like with biochar, like 50% of the studies say not much of a response or not economically viable. Another half say well, all these beneficial things are, are, are happening. In terms of uh, making Hawaii more sustainable, we can see that there's a lot of things we could be growing a lot more of, and that about 85% of our food supply is imported. In the event of a crisis, we're in trouble because basically, the, to, to, at anthropologists told about you need to be producing about 70% of your carbohydrates in the event of a crisis to, to, to make it through. And, if, and that's one of the things people say, oh, we don't have to worry about growing rice, potatoes, wheat, or any of that stuff. 
or t even more t taro, and it just it kind of really scares me. And it's just, people say well, we can't grow those things because it's not not going to make enough money. But it, we're not going to be very food secure if all we're doing is growing leafy vegetables and carrots and whatever. Um, so I uh, Norm, <laughs> see here, page down, enter, it's frozen. Where's it? This click on this. Where's it? Touch. Okay. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting when relating to that fact that we're, we're growing only maybe 20% of our, our food, land area pretty much suggests that as well because if you take about 1,500 meters squared of land area to produce a standard American diet, and you look as a state, you only have 300 meters squared under cultivation. That means probably you know we're only producing about 20% of our food locally. Interesting, Kauai has the most land area per populate uh, per person under uh, agricultural cultivation. We all know this that you know our impressive yields in Hawaii for the most part have been due to heavy uh, inputs. And as Hector so uh, well uh, outlined this morning, sustainable agriculture embraces ecological principles and integrated approaches like integrated pest management to reduce dependence on synthetic chemicals, preserve the soil, water resources, uh, et cetera. Uh, somehow this didn't um, all show up here. I don't know what's going on, but uh, basically what this, this slide was to show is that uh, in the U.S., you know, most of the agriculture is chemical, derived from the Haber-Bosch process to make, make nitrogen. Uh, one thing, I had, a, I had a corn slide up there. I don't know what happened to it, but it was... You know, an average uh, chemically grown corn. Now, if you watch Symphony of the Soil uh, movie that's been going around the island, uh, that is a case of actually the worst growing conventional corn. They powderized the soil, moldboard plow, which very few conventional farmers even do anymore, and then uh, did secondary tillage to the soils, basically powderized, and they had this corn that was this yellow and horrible looking. But then, what it, this slide was supposed to show on, on next was maybe if I hit enter it. I don't know. Oh, there it goes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, anyways, the, the thing that, that, that's troubling is that, you know, that we grow the corn, we feed the cows, and then we import manure to Hawaii and claim we're, we're organic. And this is, this is a big problem in, in corporate organic agriculture. My brother worked for one of the biggest multinational agriculture corporations, I won't mention his name, but it had some of its roots in Hawaii. And uh, he uh, uh, was talking about in both South America and uh, uh, Central America that his company was buying up all the manure to uh, just grow organic, but the farms themselves weren't that they were getting the manure from wasn't was organic. And this is what when I talk to European scientists, they always hammer me because in our European organic standards are so much higher. We believe in integrated systems, not where you have some chemical dairy. You're taking the manure from it, putting it on an organic farm, and then marking everything as organic. Um, this is an interesting picture of what Hawaii once was. I mean, we were food self-sufficient in 1910, basically. And you look at that slide of he Heia on the island of Oahu, and they were growing rice and taro in the fertile uh, wetland soils and on the, uh, that was derived from alluvium. On the colluvium on the slopes, they were growing banana, citrus, and other uh, crops. But you look up in the hills, they are barren. I mean, and if you look at old pictures of Hawaii in the early 1900s, even around Hakalau, Pepekeo, the gulches were pretty barren. Everything was just, just chopped down. I and mean, they, were, they were burning up all the trees for, for fuel. The, the sugarcane plants were using it for heating. They were using it for everything. They were taking the ash, in the case of Heia, and dumping the ash back in the rice paddies because, like almost all of our wetland soils in Hawaii, we don't have vermiculite or illite or biotite minerals in the clays. And so when they started to feed the, the, the masses, the, the, the plantation workers and everything, they started depleting the soils of potassium. So they were dumping wood ash back, back in there. And even today, you go around, most of the lands were formerly cultivated intensively on taro and rice in the wetlands. Uh, Dr. Carper and I have been practically every wetland in, in the state um, uh, and taken samples, and it's, it's pretty dang low in potassium. So if we were to reestablish our wetland farming systems, uh, we'd have challenges. Of course, today, those areas are taken over mainly by California grass that were formerly used for extensive rice and taro cultivation. When we look at soil, some of the challenges we're discussed today is that sometimes you don't always start off with the best conditions. Many of our soils in Hawaii are heavily leached, full of iron and aluminum oxides. Uh, the potassium is washed out, the phosphorus is piled up with iron and aluminum. Some of the better soils, more, more analogous to mainland mollies alls. Um, this soil is from actually the Hagi area on the right. Uh, the organic matter is high in the, in the surface horizon. It is in a rainfall zone where there's enough rainfall to have weathering of the rock and, and the parent materials. 
but it didn't leach out all the, the potassium, calcium, magnesium. The phosphorus is more available because it, it, uh, the, the iron hasn't all been released into iron oxide um, uh, forms. Hawaiians were smart. When they, on this island and Maui, when the population reached the potential that the, the, the valleys couldn't sustain the population, they sought out sweet spots of soil fertility where the trade-off between uh, uh, weathering and, and uh, soil fertility was, was good and there was enough rainfall to grow crops. Uh, and, and so those sweet spots were like the Kahala field systems, the Kona field systems, the Kalu field system. Uh, parts of Waimea, they said the Waimea one was more of a rotational type of system. That, I mean, not the Waimea, but the, the Hamakua one, nor, north of Hilo, was more of a rotational one. It wasn't consistently cropped, and that's probably because the soils there were more highly um, weathered. But if you notice, the whole Hilo coast, that was basically a banana and breadfruit zone. It wasn't a place where you grew a lot of sweet potatoes or anything. And, and Puna had some agriculture, but it wasn't as intensely cultivated as um, the areas with high inherent soil fertility. Some of the remnants of the old sweet potato field systems in Kohala, sweet spots of soil fertility. Um, that's me back when I was a college of ag student in the cane fields above Hilo. Uh, it, when the plantation era was here, they cleared the, the, a lot of the forest. They said like on the ships passing by Hilo, you could just see the smoke for like 10 years from all the, the forest clearing. Um, I always go to conferences like this and people say, oh, you know, uh, the sugarcane industry on the Hilo Coast depleted the soil. They started out with junk soil to begin with, dumped a bunch of chemicals on there so they could grow, and lime so they could grow the cane. And today, if um, I was really fortunate to go up um, above Onamea and Pepekea with Dr. Patrick Niemeyer, the um, retired USDA NRCS soil scientist, I almost killed myself up there. It was on my 47th birthday. We're hiking through Vi V, thick and so thick. It was just steaming hot. We were using ropes to climb up the gulches and everything to, to get to these sites to find the same soil types as it was in the cane fields, but not in areas where you know they cleared and planted eucalyptus and, or the vibe all invaded. And the, the things we found was is that the, uh, the pH in the cane fields, there was still a bit of a legacy of the, the lime effect. Uh, the phosphorus was higher in the cane fields, but it wasn't available. It was all tied up with iron and aluminum. Organic carbon, as you'd expect, was higher um, in the forest. And the one other thing that these soils were a lot higher in is arsenic, because of the arsenicals. I, I'd like to publish that work, but what we're doing is we're going to do a follow-up, because what I'm real curious is we sampled in 2010 to see how the organic matter is changing over time in, in the, uh, uh, the, the former um, uh, cane fields. Now Dave Sansone is in the room. Uh, he's looking at agroforestry approaches. And, um, Craig Elevich and some others pioneered those on, on the Big Island back in the early 90s, and we did a lot of studies on those, and, and some of those perennial vegetables and things, they really work well, the mulching systems, the using the nitrogen-fixing trees, they work, they can be labor-intensive, that's a challenge. One thing that some of the early people were saying was is that the, the thing is, is we can grow all this food on these, these soils that are so leached out, but people don't, they're not into eating seropis or perennial lettuce and all these, <laughs> these things. So uh, we, we tried to introduce these things at school here. We, we shared it with students, but it's like, I don't know how many of them. Other than seropis, there's a few kids that really got excited about that, and I know former students who still grow uh, the, the seropis. Um, incorporation of the perennials for, for these things. This is out of Mexico. Why don't I get, this is in Mexico. This is a real interesting system where the, the nitrogen fixing trees on the streams, uh, 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 the, the, the little drainage ditches, their leaf litter falls in and then they scoop it out once a year uh, and uh, put it as a soil amendment and then they rotate one side of the field from alfalfa to corn and back to um, alfalfa uh, again. Uh, some of these types of systems, you know, they are labor intensive uh, and that's a challenge I think in Hawaii. I mean, in the Philipp in remote parts of the Philippines you'll find uh, like people who are doing these systems because they don't have any other avenue. Uh, J.B. Friday and Extension will tell you, as soon as the bus comes to these rural villages, all the young people, they're off to the city, and labor becomes a real constraint. Uh, Hector mentioned Cuba, but uh, when Cuba got cut off from Russia, Fidel said, okay, uh, people are underemployed, you're going to go help the farmers. And I know a lot of us would love to have some extra help on the, on the farms and things, but you know, these systems do work, but, but they, are, they, are, they are challenging. Uh, this is just another slide looking at what happened with, with rice systems and things and that, uh, you know, the, the valleys are where the nutrients get concentrated, but as soon as, as soon as people in Asia started double and triple cropping rice per year, then they started pulling out more nutrients that were coming in the system in, in, the, in the drainage waters, and, and that's been real challenging. An interesting thing about rice is that 
I've read some of the early literature on rice. It's like as soon as they put chemical fertilizer out, some of the traditional rice would just fall over and lodge because they couldn't handle it. Uh, and so they started, we started selecting, as Hector and Norm and others mentioned, we started selecting for varieties that are adapted to, to high inputs. Now, we did greatly increase yield with, with chemical um, fertilizers. Uh, another thing we really need to look at, we've heard a lot today about nitrogen, but phosphorus. I mean, phosphorus is getting expensive because it's, it's, we're not going to probably run out anytime soon, but it's going to be just so dang expensive to, to recover it. And I don't see how we're going to, um, oh, sorry. Uh, how we're going to recover it, uh, and, 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 and I mean, in and, and, and a costly manner, we need to look at start recycling sewage. Uh, we're, it's ridiculous. We landfill sewage full of phosphorus, and a critical element uh, needed for plant nutrition um, in, uh, in in Hawaii. And uh, the other thing that we're, there's a there's an opportunity is uh, increase breeding plants to to uh, have more of the phosphorus available to the consumers of the plant, so less gets excreted. Uh, and, and making it more efficient for, for animal utilization. Because like with, with a lot of livestock, a lot of the phosphorus comes out in manure rather than it's being utilized. Sewage sludge composting is being done in a lot of states are already. And Hawaii, Jim Carpenter mentioned the work we did. The sewage in Hawaii is no different basically than pig manure. We don't really, I mean, there can be contaminants from pharmaceuticals and things, but our sewage is, and it's even less than things like copper, than, than which sometimes the levels of copper and other metals really high in mainland where they have industri industrial contamination, our sewage has a lot of potential for agriculture use. Maybe not putting on vegetable crops like it's done for a thousand years in Asia, but we could definitely put it in growing feed crops and biomass crops, etc. Um, these integrated systems are going to become more of a player in Hawaii, like Pacific Biodiesel. Pacific Biodiesel right now, they have potassium hydroxide in the catalyst process of making biofuel. They, they add the potassium hy hydroxide to make the biodiesel. They get a byproduct potassium sulfate that precipitates out. Um, they have various products of that potassium sulfate, some of it has like molasses-like material mixed into it. If they remove all that, it's basically like the same as regular potassium sulfate fertilizer, but because it's not from a natural process, the organic people say, no, we don't want to um, use it. But to me, a lot of the organic standards don't make sense. You can use humic acid in organics, and that's extracted with sodium hydroxide, reprecipitated out with sulfuric acid. That's okay, but something like this isn't. You know, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense sometimes the standards uh, that are going on. But I have to say I'm really concerned about organic standards in this country in the sense of what's going on in food additives and things like, like that. Uh, you know, we, we're going to have to put a lot more science behind what we do in organics and um, uh, or else the whole, the whole concept might just be really diluted out. World population growth, um, this one is just a, a real concern is that, you know, like ecologists will say, if we were to do an environmentally friendly earth, we need about 4.5 billion or less, not any 9 billion. It's going to be a, a real challenge uh, to do that all um, sustainably uh, with, with 9 billion people. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I look at organics practices as, as, as an alternative, but we have to also weigh the yields that we need to achieve because if you look at food production globally in the last 50 years we've doubled food production while only increasing land acreage by nine percent so if we take a, if we just say cut off chemical fertilizer today I think it'd be real hard pressed to, to maintain that but I think the organic research shows when you when, when you integrate organic practices that oftentimes you see a, 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 a yield a rapid yield decline and then the, as you keep these practices longer term, they, the yields start to, to, to climb again. And uh, that's one of the big troubles with university research is they say, oh, you only got to be funding for a three-year study, uh, what have you. And the whole fact that, as has been mentioned today, that many of our production research positions throughout the universities, land-grant universities in the United States have been lost to, to laboratory science and modelers rather than people out there who are actually working with the practitioners and the farmers and doing field production trials. So some conclusions, uh, current land under cultivation in Hawaii falls short of, of uh, Smill's estimated area to feed the Hawaiian population. All Hawaiian lands were created equal, but uh, some have just weathered more than others. And the upland areas of Ma Hawaii and Maui um, that are relatively fertile, um, they won't, may not need such intensive management, but a lot of them do need water to get going. Um, and the other conclusions would be most upland areas on the older islands are highly leached. and um, Ash soils 
you're going to need a lot of uh, care to become productive, and, and we may not be able to, to grow the same kind of crops that we grew in the past. We have to grow crops that are better adapted to those areas. And I would really like, I, I appreciate today's um, dialogue because we in academia and the, the general public and the practitioners of farmers, we need to get a greater understanding of what's going on and to have an informed discussion. And I'm really frustrated as a whole that um, a lot of scientists are not being objective. You find guys that are, that are pro this and only cite the papers that are pro what they believe and other guys only cite the things that are anti rather than putting it together. It's hard to find real good comprehensive reviews and as a general public you get really confused. It's like me if I start reading things about treating cancer or something, I get really confused. I had cancer and I tell you I got really confused on the, the alternative treatments and what's, what's being said by whom because it's, just, it's such a mishmash. We need more ethics in science and people to look at the whole picture rather than just taking what they believe and charging forward with it. Amen. One last thing I just want to say is our future food and energy security requires a total landscape approach with the reconciliation of environmental integrity and agricultural productivity. It's going to take all of us to do it, and maybe, just maybe, we'll make a little difference after today. Thank you. See, we, we maybe have t t 10 minutes, Margaret, and then we can eat break for lunch. Yeah, sounds good. Um, and I don't know, uh, Mike, if you had a couple minutes or comments on what's going on, and um, Cab, and um, what else did we have here? Um, Let's give you one, to, one or two minutes. So can, yeah. I want to run something to you guys, yeah, to the audience. Where compost is so good. Can you let us come up on a line? No yeah. stories on the fifth and fourth. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> okay, I'm going to leave you guys with a scenario. Yeah? Um, this is a true scenario. I'm going to put it forward to the compost people. This was part of the composting session that I always going to do. Okay, you guys stop writing down these numbers and give you stuff. Five dollars sixty-nine cents a gallon per diesel. Okay, got that. Water is at equilibrium, meaning that uh, there's water fights going on for agriculture versus humans. The highest electricity cost in the world, yeah. meaning that it is even higher than what you see in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fertilizer is at $1,450 a ton and climbing. We're down to two airlines, and the barge only comes twice a week, and they're going to raise their price. What did I just describe? Unsustainability. Huh? Unsustainability. Dependency. Our current situation. Now. <laughs> it is. I just explained to you guys what's happening on Molokai. Oh, If we cannot nip the thing at Molokai, is this going to be the same situation we're going to be on the big island? Everything is coming down. So like the composting people play a very important role. Yeah. Molokai, Chris is leading the lead. He's going to bring in all his top farmers from Molokai to the big island. Hopefully we can hook up with the EM people, we can hook up with the IMO people to teach these guys how to compost. Because you're on the last rock. The farmer's ready to give up on one of you. So that's, that's the message that I'm leaving you. We need to react now. No way. Research got to be done. Because it's already happening on one island. That's it, yes. Just uh, the, the big problem we have here is uh, Right now, the uh, mayor just shortlisted five companies to handle our waste, and they're all incineration technologies. The problem with incineration technologies is because it generates such little uh, waste stream compared to other parts of the world that it's going to require all the rubbish we can put in it, including recyclables, including compost. So what the mayor's proposing right now with incineration companies runs against everything we've heard today. 
as far as we're going to need to have compost sources for the cost you for IMOs or EMs and just put them out the table. Okay. <coughs> Making sure something I don't want to be paying attention to. Has anybody heard of tax up before the Florida Tax Compliance Act? July 1st, 2014, it goes into effect. All international trade in the United States become complicated. Yeah. There's a lot more paperwork we gotta file. It means the dollar value is dropping like a rock. China's already not accepting the dollar in parts of the world. What does that mean for all the economics that's going on right now? Where is it? Grab it. What we're looking at is an emergency situation of food. Where is the food? Where is the water? We're not set up for that. It's a month and a half away. What we do? Adding that to the table. A very good point. And again, the reason why I want to reiterate the urgency of us making some kind of real change right now, whether it's your own backyard garden, which Noah and I experienced for years in our little biosphere there in Waimea, or it's your school garden, or it's a larger entity. Bokashi is the shortcut to the nature farming. You don't have to be well educated in ginseng farming to put Bokashi on your land. You don't have to be well educated in IMO to put Bokashi on your land. This is one of the fastest ways we can remediate and produce food for ourselves. It's very clear anybody that tries Bokashi with any product you're using, no matter what your regime is, you add Bokashi to it, you're going to see a boost. We've seen this time and time again. And it will also clean our environment at the same time. So we brought in some manure that was contaminated from the mainland. Or we brought in a local resource that was contaminated. The Bokashi will clean it up for us. It will also stabilize the arsenic lands that we talk about, the arc conventional farming did for us. We will take care of that and we will protect our soil roots. We'll lock that arsenic into the soil so it's not available to us or the environment. The Bokashi, the effective microorganisms, is our immediate way to combat these things. Whether it's making fertilizer with uh, Bobby Grimes' suggestion, that could be the fertilizer place for people like Chris Robb that doesn't have the time to go into the five-phase IMO and make his own fertilizer, but he's got plenty of time to take that bag that we produce for him, put it on the field, and make more high-quality produce for us. So we need to keep people in the jobs that they're doing and supply them with what they need, and then we can make a transition to composting on site like Noah talks about, and getting our farms themselves self-sufficient. But there is a transition time, and we talk about that in the next 10 years. How do we do that transition? How do we stop and curtail imports so that we start doing something about it? Is it going to happen in six weeks, in a month and a half? Are we really going to see a big curtailment, and then where people are going to start becoming more resourceful? So however it goes, whatever path we're taking, we have to encourage effective microorganisms in our world because they're going to hold our water and they're going to feed us. And that's the basic question. Bokashi can be made from anything. We can take field crops of any kind and make Bokashi. What would you suggest? Right now, what I see is we have lots of cane land that's not used. And I would even suggest that we could coppice and ferment that. We could cut that down. And yeah. later on, we want to plant fields intentionally of certain crops that we know will give us high nutrition and do the same type of thing. It, it, there's waste, waste uh, green waste that's available. You can do things with that. And you can Bokashi green waste. It's another way to handle it without uh, the composting kind of situation. And you get more volume of organic matter back into your soil. And it's closer to building real soil because it's diversified microbially as opposed to maybe a compost that's taking your yields down for the first few applications. EM is made well. EM is made right now in Arizona. There is an EM uh, facility that was on Oahu and they shut that down. We had the best EM in the world, according to all the research, but we shut that down uh, because of production in the mainland and that was going to be consistent for the nation of the United States. So EM versus IMO. EM versus IMO. Let's put them both on the same field and we'll see them run to the middle of the field. And if this is IMO and this is EM, when they get to the middle of the field, the IMO takes over the EM and the EM goes underneath the IMO. So basically, they both work and they're synergistically. And if we want best cropping, we start with EM and it gives the, the lattice work for the IMO to finally move in and give us the top most cropping. IMO is indigenous microorganism. 
Yes, indigenous microorganisms. However, what we do realize is microorganisms exist throughout the world, and indigenous microorganisms will be encouraged by effective microorganisms on the scene. Is, is the EM a special strain of microorganism that is it's indigenous to somewhere, yeah? It, it is a special mix, and, and like uh, Noah was explaining, you know, we have three basic microorganisms that function to do different things to our soils or to what we're digesting. So GM is, is a combination, it's a, it's a mixture, it's a recipe. It's a mixture of microorganisms that are in symbiotic relationship with each other, so they eat each other's waste. They might not normally be found together in uh, in nature, but when we put them together, they eat each other's waste, so they're constantly cleaning themselves, and then you put them on something else that's dirty to clean up, well, they'll clean that up, and after they clean that up, they'll start cleaning themselves again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Just to clarify on the EM and Bokashi, as I understand it, Bokashi is just a recipe of organic amendments that you put together as a kind of as a conduit for microbial inoculation of the, of, of the soil. Uh, as I understand it, EM is more of a liquid preparation, inoculation, uh, that you, that, that you uh, apply on the soil. Uh, I have done some research with both on, on replicated trials, and I have observed ambivalent uh, results. In some cases, I've seen some benefits in some others, I haven't, but I work mostly in good con soil conditions. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of a skeptic in general and believe that, first of all, there's no recipes that you can say this, this is applica applicable for all conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have some soil that is on a transition uh, from conventional to organics or degraded in some way, amendments may help. If you already are, have a real good quality soil, I don't think that out of site applications are going to help you a lot, uh, unless you happen to have a disease or so on. Uh, I just want to mention that the word I'm getting, uh, even from Oahu, is that we're getting a lot of young kids, uh, young, young people starting to farm. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm sure that in, in, in the big island that's also the same case. Uh, but no matter how you cut it, farming, it's, it's, it's real tough. Uh, it, it, it's very, it's, it's, it's a, a lot of work, and you really don't have the time to be playing around with this or that. You, you have to farm, you have to grow your tomatoes, whatever you're doing. Uh, internationally, there's all kinds of things going on. Uh, there's places all over the world where there's a lot of new things, new developments uh, coming up in Mexico, Israel, Japan, Italy, all kinds of new machinery, new techniques. Normally, it takes about 10, 15, 20 years for one technique to come from one region to another, mm -hmm. uh, if ever. Many times it, we, we never got it. And what we observed in, in Korea to Hawaii was one of, an example of somebody that took the energy to actually make that happen. The purpose of the university is to bring those good ideas to see how they work locally and to share that with local growers. That is kind of the purpose of the land grant university. For that to happen, we need industry groups from the different communities, baseball growers, the organic growers, to come up as one voice and say, this is what we need to administrators. So administrators can pass the word to faculty that doing this kind of work is, 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 is valued, is, impo is important for the state. Because our agriculture right now is here, and we wanted to bring it to this kind of level. In the big states, Michigan State, Florida, New York, we did that research back in the 50s and 60s, all that basic research, how to grow tomatoes, how to grow lettuce properly. In Hawaii, we're still back in like 30 years ago, and we need all that fundamental basic research, just basic stuff, how to work the soil, what kind of tractor do I use to grow my lettuce, and so on. Basic stuff, because what we need to do is develop the basic research so that when a young person wants to start farming, he's ready to go. We have all the best techniques, this is how you irrigate your field, this is how you grow to your tomatoes, this is how you space them, uh, these are the amendments that you need to apply to make it as easier as, as possible to succeed in farming. Uh, because you won't be making money until about five to six years after you start farming. Uh, so you want to make it as easy as possible. The hardest thing to do is to convince somebody to start farming. So once they start farming, we should make sure that they, that they succeed. Uh, so I just wanted to share that. Thank you. One thing that 
could really help these young farmers are big grants so that they can last that period of time to get their, their production up and off the ground. So this is what is required for them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we're going to break for lunch in a minute, and there's plenty of food out here. Everyone uh, can wander around. There are a number of different limits up here. But I just want anyone who wasn't here at the beginning to introduce themselves, who came in after we started. Um, anyone who, yes? Um, I'm, I'm Cass Van with the manager of the Hawaii Ant Lab. So we're going to talk about ants, so we have Yeah, okay. And you are? Isis Morrison. Okay. And anyone else here? Yes? Marcy Montgomery with Long Island. Okay. I'm a Scout and a conservation lab. And um, go ahead. Peter DeVries, I'm uh, representing Sustainable Oklahoma. Okay. And in front? Spring and Cane, um, Big Island and Lisa Species Community. Okay. Yeah. Connor Ware. Okay. Um, Margaret Massey, the floor. Um, yeah, just a touch Go ahead. Yes. Hi, everybody. You've all been very nice to be patient with our cameras. My name is Scott Kennedy, and our crew here is Trace Sheehan and Marky Donnelly. We're making a documentary about many of the issues that you guys are talking about today. And I thank you very much for, for uh, allowing us to have the cameras here. If you have any questions, please talk to us afterwards. And uh, it's about uh, feeding the world in 2050, very much what you were talking about, and 9 billion people. And how are we going to do it? And how are we going to do it without doing further damage to the planet? So, uh, if you have any ideas that we should know about, please talk to us. Thank you. Okay. So we can't eat in here. So I think what we're going to do is like take 20 minutes, um, eat, and then we're going to come back in here and then spend a little time on the the little red fire, the fire <coughs> issue in Springer Cave. I'm glad you are here. I know she can't stay that long. So we will start exactly at um, one o'clock. Carpenter? Yes? Uh, before we break for lunch, how many know the organization CAST? Council for Agricultural Science and Technology. Anybody ever heard of it before? No. Okay. I would encourage you, you can go to their website. It's cast-science.org. And these are, it's a nonprofit organization that involves scientists from across, throughout the world, and all kinds of specialties. And I just brought just some title pages, but if you go on there, they have issue papers. This is an example of animal agriculture and global food supply. It's about a 190-page document that just talks about food and animals. This is on the potential impacts of mandatory labeling of genetically modified. This is on waste management and utilization. And all these documents are anywhere from 60 to 100. One document's up to 900 pages. This is food, fuel, plant, nutrient use, animal feed versus human food. The discussion as far as the competition between foods, food stuffs, potentially they're used for animals. This is on integrated animal waste management. This is on contribution of animal products. So just They've probably got a hundred and some odd documents, which are task force documents, bringing in experts, different diversities. Uh, it's just a wonderful resource to consider. And it's a lot of research that's been done that they're actually citing. And in the end of these documents, it gives you all of the citations of the references of where the science comes from. So an excellent source. and. Uh, I encourage you to go. Let me just say, uh, all of the attendance lists we're going to have, and we're going to make that available. So if you don't want your name and contact information known, you need to mark that down. Because otherwise, everyone here is going to be able to contact everyone here about whatever. <laughs> on this issue. One fast off. A couple of ideas I want to put out there before we all go live so that we can just kind of model of what we eat. Um, we're talking about sustainability, yes? Yeah? Yeah. We stay in Hawaii, yeah? yeah? So the Hawaii system, sustainable, completely, 2,500 years before this topic was brought up. Between 1849 and 1865, Hawaii, number one agricultural exporter. 
United States. And we wasn't even part of it yet. So I didn't think about it. 